Good morning. Did you have a good week in the Lord? Brother Joseph said, we thank you for your mercies. I, I found myself more thankful for his mercy and grace and just for the things he gives us. He brought Brother Danny and them to us safely, answered prayer for, as uh, Lisa mentioned there with Beth. And so many things to be thankful for. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Danny asked me this morning, he says, John doing devotional? I said, I, said, I said, yeah, after all, week, all weekend of talking about how Melissa could have done better, I get the last say here. So. It don't sound like it. <laughs> no, uh, I thank y'all for your prayers there for their traveling mercy and pray for them tomorrow as they head back home and for the prayers that we've all prayed for Brother Danny's health. Y'all can look at him and tell him he's doing good. Yeah. But, and uh, appreciate that. Pray about everything. Pray without ceasing. Bear one another's burdens. I tell you what, I told y'all when my grandmother had cancer, of course we, uh, she eventually passed away from it, but the path we took there, when somebody says pray for my loved one, they've got cancer, I can bear that burden now. Because I've been there. I can identify with it. And uh, We're going to be in Second Samuel chapter 19. We left off last time with Hushai delivering the message to David. We last discussed the two runners. Now Hushai delivered the message to David that Absalom was dead. He said, that young man be as all those that rose up against you. And Ab uh, David here just falls apart. So we're going to read the first eight verses here of chapter 19. And it was told Joab, Behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people, for the people heard say that that day how the king was grieved for his son. And the people got them by stealth that day into the city, as the people being ashamed still away when they flee in battle. They came home like they were retreating, like they'd lost the victory. David really turned this victory into defeat, if you will, which is sad. But the king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And Joab came into the house to the king and said, Thou hast shamed this day the faces of all thy servants, which this day have saved thy life and the lives of thy sons and, thy, and of thy daughters and the lives of thy wives and the lives of thy concubines. And that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends. For thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither princes nor servants. For this day I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all we had died this day, then it had pleased thee well. Now therefore arise and go forth and speak comfortably unto thy servants. For I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry one with thee this night. And that will be worse unto thee than all the evil which befell thee from thy youth until now. Then the king arose and sat in the gate, and they told, Behold, all the people saying, Behold, the king doth sit in the gate, and all the people came before the king of Israel, for, uh, before the king, for Israel had fled every man to his tent. A sad chapter here, isn't it? And there's no gap here from the previous chapter to this. Most of the time these chapters are a border for a time frame here, but this is just a continuation. You saw after the battle there, they come and told Joab what David was doing. He's covered his face, said that Joab had to go to the king's house that they had set up over there. A man that eulogized Abner's death, a man that wrote the Psalms, is left basically just stammering and repeating himself, if you will. I want you to see how much grief that David has let grip him here. That he's forgotten himself, if you will. Have you ever been there? Have you ever fell into this rut? A rut is a grave with both ends kicked out of it. You find yourself in a rut that you can't get out of. Somebody has to bear our burdens, don't they? And the way you sometimes have to bear a burden is reproof. 
And that's what I want to point out this morning here is Joab's reproof to David. Now, he exaggerated a little bit here, but he got his attention. Listen, this generation we've got coming up right now, they can't handle reproof. You cannot reprove or correct them. There just ain't no, you can't do it. You can't get better if you will not take reproof. What does David do here? He responds to the rebuke that Joab gives him. When Nathan came to David, what did, and he, listen, that was some stern reproof. Thou art the man. What did David do? He responded. When I got, when I took my job with the company I'm with now, I did a lot of menial tasks, but I got my first project. And I was, y'all, I was proud. They had finally given me something to do that everybody was going to see. Let me tell you something. I was it. And I wrote this, I wrote the program, and my boss had to review it. Y'all, did he forevermore take a meat cleaver to that thing? <laughs> when he got through, there may have been 10 lines of code left when I, that I had written. He reproved me. He reproved me. He said, this ain't going to work. If I had to wake up at 2 in the morning and figure that out, that's, that's going to be a problem. You don't write code like that. You write it like this. How do we take reproof? Why do we reject reproof? Why is this current generation rejecting reproof? See, if I wanted to become a better programmer, I was going to have to do that. Take that reproof that he gave me. I'd already seen some bad programming, and I didn't want to be like that. Now, yeah, it's not a joyous occasion, is it? Now, I like the way Joab handled this. It said he went to his house. He did it discreetly. But he told David, he said, look, what you're doing, you'd rather, be, you'd rather your enemies had won. You loved your son so much that you'd rather he'd have overthrown and killed everybody. And what you're doing now is worse if you don't change the evil that will befall you is worse than anything from your youth. Open rebuke is better than what? What's Proverbs say? Let's go over to Proverbs 1. Why do we have to be rebuked or reproved? We're a fallible people. We're fallible people. We make mistakes. I've been repro That's why we're here this morning, aren't we? To be reproved. I'm not talking down to you. I'm talking with you as fellow believers here. We're going to encounter rebuke. We're going to re encounter reproof. Let's look here at verse 20. What, re what, re what rebukes and reproves us? The truth, isn't it? Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse. In the openings of the gates in the city, she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and the fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Turn you at my reproof. It says David turned, didn't he? He went and sat in the gate. And the gate's an important place there for the king to sit. Where did Absalom steal the hearts of the men? He went he went and stood beside the gate and said as they came in, he said, Oh, if I were king, let me tell you how this would be. He found the simple ones. Now listen, where we go to get our source of wisdom is important too. If I want to learn to drive a choo-choo train, who in here am I going to ask how to learn to drive a choo-choo train? <laughs> I was going to ask Harold. <laughs> That's why we're. What's the, why us young men are instructed to seek wisdom from the older men. They've been this way here before. You can't get better if you will not take instruction. You will never improve. You will never be a better Christian if you cannot take the reproving of the Holy Spirit. And that's my challenge for us here this week. 
as we go into a new week. We're going to face some rebuke. My wife rebukes me every day. Uh, she told me the other day, you're in your second childhood for the third time. We've got to stop this. But what is she doing? She's making me a better person. I learned now you don't put reds in with the whites when you do laundry. Everything turns pink, you know. Reproof. Reproof. When I first started getting up here speaking, I made a few little mistakes, and Brother Joseph said, hey, do this, don't do that. Why? He wanted to see me improve. Most of the time when people, Joab wanted to improve David here. He was not doing this to be hateful. He did not have a cloak of malice about him. He was just warning him, this is, this is terrible. This is treacherous. You're throwing these men away that they have risked their lives for you. In my line of work, after my boss reproved me and I went back and rewrote that, it's still running today. That, that very code. I wrote it in 2007, so it's got some mileage on it. And not only that, I learned to start pushing stuff over there. Hey, check this for me. And Ben Agee was a big reprover of my code. Oh, goodness. He's brutal. But then I get to thinking, not only in that, but I get to thinking of the men of God that I've stood under that's reproved me or that's called me out. That was not a joyous occasion. That was not a joyous occasion. But look where, look where what God did with that reproof and how when I reacted to it the way I should. No discipline is joyous. We talk about the trials and tribulations that we're going through. What are they doing for us? If we bear them with patience. If we bear them with patience. You young children, y'all are growing up. You're going to encounter a lot of reproof. Accept it. Accept it. Learn from it. David did here. This is the second time that David has encountered. Because we're all going to fall in that rut. It's amazing here to see him decimated like this. A man that wrote the 51st Psalm after the deal with Bathsheba can't even break out of this. But Joab comes and reproves him and breaks him out of it. Breaks him out of it. I'm, I've often thought whenever I read this about Jesus said, he that loveth father, mother, or brother more than is unworthy. We get so attached to our earthly things that somebody has to come along and reprove us. My dad used to say, and he still does say this, son, it's okay to have things, but don't let things have you. And he was warning me because I was pursuing things. He was rebu rebuking me and reproving me. And it took it a little while to set in. The Bible says train up a child, and when he is what? Old, he will not depart from it. Reproof. Wisdom. Second Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Paul was writing that to Timothy. All Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God for reproof. When we read this, does it reprove us? What do we do with that reproof? Beg, yes, sir. Beg. This week when we encounter, we, nowadays we call it constructive criticism. <laughs> You know, we've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to come up with these new labels because we don't like it. it. It plain hurts, okay? Reproof hurts. If it's done right, if it's really reproof. Why? Why was I hurt that morning when my boss took the meat cleaver out of my coat? Because he cut my pride up and diced it up, buddy, like chicken. Made mince meat out of it. But he made a better programmer out of me. This word will make a better Christian out of us, which is far more profitable 
as it says there in 2 Timothy, far more profitable than this worldly stuff I've done. I hope I've challenged you this morning. I love you. May the Lord bless you.